thank you, Mayur, for giving me an opportunity to be the night watchman on day one of a beautiful program which you have carved for all of us. Aspirin and diabetics. I think it's a very pertinent topic and thank you for giving me an opportunity to share my views on this. So I shall dwell upon the role of aspirin in diabetics as uh, why is diabetic population spe special? We'll have a couple of case discussions. We'll review some current guidelines in the history of aspirin and the aspirin and diabetes for prevention, whether it is for secondary or primary prevention. And finally, the conclusions. When we look at the data from a number of studies, what we find is that the diabetic patients across all age groups continue to have almost doubling of the ASCVD or the arteriosclerosis vascular, uh, cardiovascular disease risk. Right from the age 50 till 75, there's almost doubling of a cardiovascular risk. This makes it feels that probably whatever interventions we are going to make in general population, diabetics are going to respond in a much better manner. Similarly, when we look at the mechanistic studies suggested at molecular level, <clears throat> which predispose diabetic population towards increased atherosclerosis or atherothrombosis like hyperglycemia, deficient insulin action, associated metabolic conditions, or other cellular abnormalities, uh, which it functions through platelets or endothelial dysfunction. And through all these mechanisms, diabetics have increased platelet additions. Platelets are more reactive. There is more chances of platelet dysfunction. The, it, and diabetes make milieu more prothrombotic, and there is increased turnover of platelets. And all this leads to probably the epidemiological changes which we saw in the previous slide. To elucidate my point further, let us look at a couple of cases. And the first case is a 60-year-old male diabetic, uh, 15 years on appropriate anti-diabetic medication. Additionally, he had a PCI five years back and there is no additional uh, risk and has a lipid profile, probably not the best of lipid profile for him. So in this patient, Obviously, we would like to correct for a secondary chances of uh, coronary event. We should give him appropriate diet, which is rich in vegetables, fruits, nuts, whole grain, whole grain, lean protein, and fish. We must suggest him to exercise regularly. And if he's smoking, we must ask him to smoke to stop smoking. And definitely, he needs statins for secondary preventions. And the goal of blood pressure should be less than 130-80. So this is something which we do routinely to reduce his chances of having an acute coronary event or a coronary heart disease. But what about aspirin? What is the current status of aspirin for such patients? Or basically, what is the status of aspirin in diabetics for secondary prevention? So this is one of the largest meta-analysis which is recorded in the history of patients of diabetics and non-diabetics about the role of aspirin for secondary prevention. So what we find is in this meta-analysis that more than 195 randomized trials with more than 1,35,000 patients which comprised of uh, diabetic as well as non-diabetic patients who were studied for serious primary vascular event for myocardial infarction, stroke, or vascular death. And the result was that there was a significant preventive role of aspirin for all the patients who were already diagnosed to have either acute coronary, either myocardial infarction or had undergone revascularization. So with such a big data, uh, AHA, ESC, or any other guideline did not have any hesitation for recommending aspirin, the dose of 75 to 100 milligram daily for patients with previous MI or those who have undergone revascularization. <clears throat> the data is so enormous that probably we can carve it on the stone 
uh, based upon the historical aspirin trials that lifelong aspirin for se uh, secondary prevention is the rule and probably no further studies or data is needed for this indication. Now let us look at another case, almost similar uh, demographic profile. The only difference is that this patient did not undergo a coronary revascularization, did not ever had mitral infarction. Uh, he's a current smoker and underwent a coronary CT for CAC, uh, for CAC scoring and was found to be 200. So basically it's a primary prevention uh, we are looking at. And of course, whatever we talked about in the secondary prevention about the uh, supportive measures, they also hold true in patients of primary prevention as well. When we look at the ASCVD risk by keying in certain important parameters or certain demographic and historical parameters, we find that the patient has ASCVD risk of 10 years of about 23%. Now for this patient who does not have evidence of overt coronary artery disease, should we be giving aspirin? And this is a debate which has continued for last 30 years with various amounts of data which is coming and going, getting changed over a period of time. However, more or less, the wave was all, always in favor of considering a low dose aspirin for primary prevention, especially for diabetics. So let us look at what is the current status of such patients for primary prevention. As we saw 30 years back, a lot of studies suggested a role of aspirin, but what changed in the last three or four years is a lot of new studies have come up and various countries have changed their guidelines. In 2016, before the uh, three guide, uh, three uh, large trials on primary prevention came in 2018. The China had uh, the guideline that all individuals with a 10 years ASCVD risk of greater than or equal to 10% aspirin should be used for primary prevention. And they have not revised the guidelines in light of three great trials of 2018. Uh, May 2021, UK in their NICE guidelines suggested that do not prescribe antiplatelet treatment for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease unless patient has a very high risk of stroke or myocardial infarction. It further went on to emphasize the role of other cardiovascular risk modifying measures such as cessation of smoking or taking statins in addition to uh, adopting healthy lifestyle and exercise. And a big no for cases who have evidence of bleeding, uh, GI bleeding, or uh, risk. European Union, I think they were very forthcoming, no ambiguity. They suggested in uh, following, uh, following a year of 2018, based upon, the guide, uh, based upon those three trials, that patients with diabetic and asymptomatic cardiovascular disease should be treated no differently to patients without diabetes. In patients with diabetes at moderate CV risk, aspirin or primary prevention is not recommended. All this data was probably based upon uh, data suggesting from a recent study that probably there is more harm. So only in minuscule of patients of diabetes who are at a very, very high risk of, uh, of ASCVD, aspirin may be considered in primary prevention. So this was what was the recommendation of European Union and what did ADA recommend for primary prevention that aspirin may be considered in those diabetics who are at increased cardiovascular risk after a comprehensive discussion with the patient on benefit versus the comparable increased risk of bleeding. So this was the, this is the, these are the current guidelines. Now, obviously this did not happen in a day it happened over a period of time. And how much period of time did it take? So let us look at how did we reach here? Aspirin use was seen almost 5,000 years back when Assyrians used it, the extracts of willow leaf for pain and fever, fast forwarding it to maybe almost 4,000 years 
Reverend Stone used a powdered willow bark to treat 50 patients with ague, which is nothing but malaria. It was 1897 that Bayer Felix, Bayer, uh, the, uh, Dr. Felix Hoffman of Bayer Corporation synthesized uh, acetyl salicylic acid as aspirin. 74 saw the first randomized control trial of aspirin for secondary prevention in men, which was published in BMJ, which showed that aspirin use is beneficial for secondary prevention uh, of coronary vascular disease and diabetic and non-diabetic. Uh, in 89, there was a US physician health study, which again showed the prevention, uh, preventive role of aspirin for myocardial infarction in men. 2005, Women Health Study uh, demonstrated the preventive role of aspirin for prevention of uh, stroke. In 2018, with the RI, Vercent, and Espri, three trials were published, all for more than 10,000 patients and we changed the guidelines uh, so much so that the question of aspirin safety for primary prevention is under clouds. How did aspirin work? How does aspirin work? And for this 1982 Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Prize was awarded to these three gentlemen. And the mechanism they postulated that the aspirin works through uh, inhibition of COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes, which lead to almost a balance of good and bad activity by blocking thromboxin A2 and by blocking prostacycline. While thromboxin A2 induces platelet aggregation, is a vasoconstrictor, induces a smooth muscle proliferation, and is also found to be pro atherogenic whereas the prostacyclines have almost the opposite effect. Now, what is interesting about aspirin is this effect of thromboxin A2 is seen in platelets, which do not have nuclei. So once the platelet are inhibited, it is for the life of the platelet, which is from seven to 10 days. Where is that the effect on prostacycline is on the endothelial uh, or, uh, or on the endothelium. And we all know that the endothelium have a nucleus. So even if the prostacycline synthesis is stopped by virtue of COX-2 inhibition. Over a period of time, nucleus generates enough of COX-2 and this prostacycline uh, gets uh, produced again. So this is what we saw and see. And additionally, if the higher dose of aspirin is used, it inhibits it uh, more as compared to uh, that of uh, COX-1. So this is the mechanism of uh, aspirin for cardiovascular disease prevention. But let me digress a little bit and let us go back in time. This was somewhere in 1910 uh, to 12 or 13 when a physician, Lawrence Grevin, who was practicing in California, uh, noticed that when he was operating on tosselectomy, he was giving children uh, a compound known as aspergum for pain relief after tonsillectomy. He kept on, he, he took this observation a bit seriously and he proceeded with this information a little ahead and advised all his male patients from the age of 40 to 65 to take aspirin. In the process, he enrolled about 8,000 patients and he observed that none of them patients over the period of uh, next seven or eight years did not observe any myocardial infarction or stroke. Of course, this was a non-randomized case control study, which never got much identity till in 70s when we saw the role of aspirin in, primary, in secondary prevention. So probably this was a time when the ball was set rolling for the uh, role of aspirin for primary or secondary prevention, probably uh, people did take a cue from Trevin. The role of aspirin in diabetic patients for primary uh, prophylaxis has been well elucidated uh, last year in Frontiers of Endocrinology when Ma has uh, published benefits and risk associated with aspirin use in patients with diabetes for the prevention of cardiovascular events and mortality. In this uh, 
uh, meta-analysis of about eight clinical trials, the latest being from the ascent, concludes that, that there is no, uh, there is only modest benefit of all-cause mortality, modest benefit of cardiovascular mortality by using aspirin in diabetic patients. Composite of maize, again, modest benefits are seen in patients of diabetes for primary prevention. And when we look at uh, bleeding events, probably two of the big trials, the ascent uh, comprising of more than, uh, I think, 12,000 patients, they found its significance. And there is this big trend towards harm, which is going against aspirin for primary prevention. So looking into all these trials, uh, the question of aspirin for primary prevention in diabetic patient is definitely uh, is questionable. Now, similar data for uh, primary prevention, this is for non-diabetic population. There is no data for diabetic, but since it's a, uh, it's a ASCVD risk calculator and we don't have data, uh, for uh, diabetes separately, but since diabetes in, is included in ASCVD risk, uh, the study which was published a couple of years back showed if ASCVD risk is less than 5%, the number needed to harm is 794, whereas number needed to treat is uh, 1,543, so almost doubling. So please read NN as NNT. When the ASCVD risk increases from 5 to 20%, the NNT or benefit is seen uh, one in 292, whereas harm is seen in 229. So if we use uh, aspirin for primary prevention in these patients of less than 20%, the more chances of getting a harm uh, in the form of uh, bleeding, which could be serious, are much higher as compared to getting a benefit out of it. So unless the ASCVD risk is more than 20%, probably that is the point when the uh, harm to benefit gets balanced. And therefore, we should not recommend aspirin in cases where uh, ASCVD risk is less than 20%. And this is the one showing balance. So we need to balance the risk of ASCVD uh, CHD death versus the bleeding risk. And this is the data which has come from a study published in circulation. Now. <clears throat> Another important investigation which is being used frequently nowadays is the CAC scoring or the uh, calcium scoring on, on CT, for which gives this, which is a surrogate marker of atherosclerosis. So the patient's blood vessels may or may not get narrowed, uh, even if the atherosclerosis is there. Patient may have significant atherosclerosis but no symptoms. So. <clears throat> The same authors looked at uh, this problem that if the CAC score was more than 100, unless the CAC score, which is seen in light green, so when we see in the light green color, and in that case, the number needed to harm is 229, is 229 as compared to the number uh, needed to treat is around 150. So. Uh, let us look at ASCVD risk of more than 20%. So number needed to harm here is 256. And this is around say 350 or 400 number needed to treat here. So unless the ASCVD risk is more than 100, patient is not going to be benefited or there may be higher chances of having bleeding as compared to having benefit of CVD prevention. So CAC score of zero, CAC score of one to 99, we see with, David, uh, with various ASCVD risk. And what we see if the CAC score is zero, number needed to harm is 794, this is 2750, suggesting that in this category of patient, uh, probably we should avoid aspirin for primary prevention. So this is the data which has come forward over a period of time. Uh, especially in the last 30 years. And based upon the available data, we can conclude that while the mechanistic and epidemiological data suggest that diabetes are at a higher risk 
of ASCVD and thus should be more likely to benefit with aspirin for both primary and secondary prevention. This is what we uh, think of looking at the mechanistic and epidemiological data. However, when we test this hypothesis with randomized controlled trials of larger size, it does not get corroborated. Uh, it does not corroborate the superiority of aspirin in patients of diabetics. Secondly, we can also conclude uh, that for secondary prevention of coronary artery disease, conclusive and robust data is available which suggests prevent a role of aspirin in diabetics or non-diabetic patients alike. For primary prevention dictum do no harm, there should be a net benefit uh, which should, which is in the form of, while the aspirin reduces the ischemic stroke and MI, aspirin increases the risk of bleeding. For patients of primary prevention with high risk, aspirin can be recommended for primary prevention below the age group of 60 years, but is contraindicated after 70 years. High risk group where ASCVD risk exceeds 20% for 10 years, NNT is better than NNH, whereas for CAC of more than hundreds, odds are in favor of aspirin. And lastly, guidelines are guidelines. We must individualize our approach and inform our patients of the potential benefits and risks and share decision making. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Mayur, for the kind invitation. Thank you.